what would you tell a volunteer who's mm -hmm. working with adult an adult learner mm -hmm. who feels they're not making enough progress helping mm -hmm. their adult improve their reading? The first thing I would say is that many of our adults have not only differences in terms of their background, but also their conceptual grasp of the very concept of reading. It takes a long time, and it takes longer for adults than for little children. Mm -hmm. So the frustration is understandable, but they have to understand too that that reading brain of an older person is going to take longer to grasp not only the concepts, but also build background knowledge. So I would tell them every single thing, every single session they do is adding to almost like a, a ge the geometric progression of reading. They are, they are helping those layers grow. It, understanding that is both physiological and experiential. So everything they do is, is a gift. You were talking yeah. about that yeah. critical thinking and those little yes. deep reading skills. Yes. Not having those deep reading skills, mm -hmm. I imagine, are greatly going to impact ability to write. Exactly. And it frightens me for our future. If we're not yes. going to have deep thinkers for reading, how are we going to have good writing in the exactly. future? Exactly. Um, one of the, my biggest worries that I didn't talk about enough was that how much we read affects everyone because it affects not just how we read, but what, what we read and what is written. So this real intersection, I even call it the digital chain hypothesis. How much affects how, how we read affects what we read, what we read affects what is written. And so I'm very worried about the density, the conceptual background, the oversimplification, the inability of, of of many of us to read more complicated, convoluted prose because it demands too much. Mm -hmm. So one of the things I'm most concerned about is that when we talk about, oh, density of writing is, is, is on decline, that's not just about uh, how many words per sentence is. It's how much the writing reflects the complexity of human thought. So Marianne, you talked about the Proustian pause, mm -hmm. and I was wondering if there's a mm -hmm. metacognitive way mm -hmm. to explicitly teach people how to add that back in since mm -hmm. it seems to be not being reflected in the way mm -hmm. we're reading now. There's no question my biggest worry really with all of this is that we are not utilizing those deep reading processes. There is no evidence that I have right now that will say this is the strategy to use for everyone. In fact, there never is one strategy. There are going to be individual differences. However, saying that, I can say from personal anecdotal experience that one of the things that I have to do is to ask myself, what is the purpose of this reading? If it's a casual purpose, I don't ask for a pause. If it's something that's really important that I grasp and am analytic, then I force myself to think before I read be sure to think, what is the inference? What, is, what are my feelings? What is my analysis of this? What is, is there an insight that I have? So I will ask myself a series of questions. That helps me slow myself down. It is not only about speed, however, it's about the focusing, the conscious focusing of certain processes for certain kinds of reading. What is the best advice that you would give to our emerging readers mm -hmm. who want to break the cycle of illiteracy with their children? Mm. The importance of reading to your child cannot be exaggerated. I want our adults to read to their children. If they cannot, I want them to have their cousins. I want these children from zero to five and five to 10 read to and have models of the pleasure of reading for all these kids that we can give that to. So that's one aspect of the question. The other is to really give a sense ourselves of how fun it can be, how engaging it can be. So one of the things that I, I really want all tutors to think about is what will engage the interest of that particular child, that particular adult. There are certain, there's even an app called 
Bookalicious, <laughs> which looks at what is the interest, and it matches interest by reading level and the, t the books that are available. Well, there will be various apps that do that, and by no means do I only want apps being guiding this process, but the elicitation of knowledge of what engages that reader um, so that it can be fun and, and, and give that new reader, that emergent reader, the pleasure of it all. So it's knowledge plus joy. So Marianne, you talked about what you're excited about in the mm -hmm. literacy field and the research and everything yes. coming. I, being what I do, know that there's a lot of challenges with mm. the schools that are training our teachers, not mm. bringing the research in right. or working with right. making sure that there's right. a bridge Comes there, together. right? Yes. And so how is it that we can get our universities that are training mm -hmm. our teachers involved in incorporating the research mm adding in the linguists to yeah, understand exactly. the language exactly. as well and all of those yeah. things. Oh, Tracy, this is a $64 million question. <laughs> this is one of the most important questions we can, we can all address. And um, the reason why I took on this new job uh, to create this center is at UCLA is because the imperative to bring research immediately, not wait 10 years, not wait 20 years, but immediately into our schools of education, whatever our training programs are, and the schools themselves, so that the teachers who are in the schools who've had the professional development have access to this knowledge. So how to do that, we have to change a lot of the things that go on into the curricula of schools of education and professional development. No question we have to do that, but we also have to address what's going on to the schools now with existing teachers. So it's a bifurcated approach and we want to look at the possibility that this Center for Dyslexia, Diverse Learners and Social Justice can join labs in the schools, the universities of California with what's going on in schools for all kinds of diverse learners and public schools. So my great joy will be connection. So we hope to build a model. I will just be like Moses. I will <laughs> not lead people into the promised land, but I will show them where to go. That's my hope with that. And then with the next generation of people will take it, take it those next steps. Your question could not be more important. Knowledge application and the reciprocal. What helps us in the schools? What are you not giving us in research? So it's a real reciprocal between research lab and labs in the classroom. So it's not just one directional, it's bi-directional. Mary Ann, you were yes. talking about being, reading to children and yes. how important it is. Yes. Can audiobooks be a form that they can use so they can access larger quantity of language books in, in an auditory format um, and that have the same effect? So there are two answers to that. There are more than two, but I want to give you only two. One is that I don't care what format it takes to get knowledge, to get the same level playing field into our kids. That said, there are differences at different developmental periods about the effect of audio. For example, in zero to five, we already know this is work by John Hutton. There's something called the Goldilocks effect that's going on. If you give a child an audio version, an animated version, you know, cartoons and all that, or an adult reading an illustrated book, the illustrated book being read has better effects than either the audio or the illustrative bells and whistles animated. So we know from zero to five, from five to 10 and, and on, a lot of our kids can't read and that's giving them conceptual information. I'm all for it. My sons who are we won't say how old they are, <laughs> but they only do audio. One only does audio because he's dyslexic. The other does only audio because he's on a Google bus and just listening the entire time. Now, am I opposed to that? No, but is it the same? No. We are unable in audio to use the benefits of recursion to go back. It's not that you can't turn the tape back, but you don't do it. Same thing with the Kindle, by the way. Mm -hmm. You are not getting the same focused experience of, of, of monitoring your comprehension. So I'm both all for it and yet want print more. 